Greetings, brothers and sisters. So, um, I watched this movie last night called Goodbye World. And not recommending it. Certainly, it's not a good movie. Entertainment-wise, it stars the guy from, um, you know, the actor, the guy who played the, the actor in Entourage. And a bunch of other people, some of whom um, I don't think were in any other movies. You know, there was low budget, and it's about a bunch of pretentious liberals, one of whom kind of realized the world was going to collapse at some point. And he and his wife have a farm in, uh, you know, California in the hills, and all his former co workers and college, you know, people that they, this clique of sort of liberal people in college are there you know, end up going there as there is a, a cyber attack. And again, not a good movie, you know, not well done, but there are interesting parts about it. And also it coming from, from sort of a liberal perspective of a doomsday scenario. Uh, but, you know, very hard to watch because of the, it's very um, relationship oriented and let's, it's just slow budget. It's not, you know, well done. The acting is pretty poor. And it's just, um, you know, it is what it is. But it definitely is the inspiration for the HBO movie, Leave the World Behind. There's a lot of similarities from the cyber attack to, um, you know, the personalities. Medicines become an issue, as they did in, in the other movie. Uh, but very similar. Like the, you know, Leave the World Behind is certainly the... the based some of it on this other movie you see this a lot there was the movie the big chill that was a remake of a low budget movie called the return of the Secaucus seven and both of them featured sort of college um level uh you know uh people who knew each other at a younger age and then are older now and then come back together sort of these reunion movies and very similar to those movies you know, in the same way that that the um, Big Chill ripped off this other movie, Leave the World Behind sort of rips off this other kind of movie. You know, where people are suffering the apocalypse in a shared house, and they have, you know, their own interpersonal issues. But I found some parts of it interesting from a perspective of, you know, the apocalypse is, uh, is upon us, right? So this movie is from 2013. And there is a segment at the end of the movie where, again, spoiler alert, I'm not, you know, it's not as much of a, uh, like a, like a movie that's got a lot of intrigue, but, you know, there are bits and pieces that are interesting. And there's a woman who works for a senator, just like the uh, Marsala Ali character worked with some guy who was an insider. And there's a message that they're getting on like old, you know, again, this is 2013, so everything's just kind of going digital and you know it's the people that still have like blackberries and things you know like it's not um you know it's probably made in 2010 2011 and so they're watching the president give a message and this woman you know they're like well that message is a is a loop right it's a re repetitive and she said yeah and she said there are certain things that he's saying because her congressman she worked with was on um you know, the NSA, you know, uh, sort of security council. And the president is a pre recorded message that's telling everybody it's about to go to martial law. And there are things that Marshall Ali found out in this other movie, Leave the World Behind, at the end, that said that this is, you know, it's an indication that it's over, right? That they're, it's much worse than they're saying. And there's some other things in there that are kind of interesting um, in terms of, you know, this, how the collapse plays out and, they, you know, they're liberal, so they don't believe in firearms, but that's an issue because, of, you know, people just going nuts and how, you know, the sheriff is getting chased out of town and, you know, people are just taking advantage of the situation, right, with their, you know, bullies end up stepping up and, you know, being, uh, you know, all these things and having to deal with all that. But both of these movies and pretty much every apocalyptic movie and just every movie in general and everything is in the mainstream media and, you know, just everyday life dealing with other Americans 
you see the reason why there needs to be a collapse. And again, the cause is in the effect, right? The effect is in the cause. Like there's cause and effect, right? The future is in the past, and the past is in the future. Like the reason for the collapse is as important as the collapse itself. Because, you know, there's things that happen in your personal life. And when you're living a bad life and you're disconnected from your soul, you're disconnected from your true purpose, things start to unravel. You see it all the time. Like I look at my period of life before I was, you know, became focused again on my spiritual side. And that was, you know, I was age 29. And I was a little bit when I was younger and then I got off of that and I was, you know, completely unaware of God or thinking about God. And those were my dark years. Those were my difficult years from the time I was about, you know, 14 to the time I was 28, 29, right? And then I found the Sajmark system and, you know, the practice and the goal that, you know, to merge back into the source and all these things. And my life changed significantly for the better. You know, I still had problems and issues and still have them, but but it's different when you have a goal and a spiritual goal and you have a spiritual philosophy and you can understand the need for miseries as a way to, you know, to help you uh, achieve your goals, obstacles and things. And so people who are away from that, who are disconnected from the source, inevitably make bad decisions. There's that one bad decision and there's all these decisions that follow, right? And when that's the case, then there needs to be some sort of, I mean, if there is a God and there is a plan, then there needs to be some sort of corrective measure. And when it's collective, when everybody's so disconnected from what their true purpose is, and the system itself is against the divine system and divine laws, you know, if such things exist, right, like I believe they exist, then there has to be a correction. And so if you believe in God, then there needs to be a correction, right? Like you can see it all around you. And the correction can't be fixing what already exists because it's the people that are, you know, across the board. You know, if you say, all right, so just the Democrats and the liberals, yeah, you know, that's not true. (laughs) You know, like the Republicans and the right wing have always sucked and sucked just as bad as the Democrats. They just don't have as much power now. Or if you're a Democrat and you believe it's they're liberal and you believe it's just the conservatives or the Republicans, you know, you, there's no sense of you realizing you're, what you have to change, right? It's just like being in a divorce. You know, you have to figure out what you did wrong. You know, why, why did you end up being in this situation? You have to remove whatever's inside you that created this dysfunctional situation. And maybe the other person sucks and is a nightmare and you could never be successful in a marriage with them, but why are you with them, right? Like, why did you choose to be with them? Why did you, in that situation, why is that part of your destiny? And so whatever your, the situation is, if you're not willing to change, and people aren't willing to change, and I can say that from being a counselor, from being a preceptor, from living life, you know, doing what I do here, the majority of people are incapable of making any major changes to themselves and even looking at the problems they have and as being you know, their own responsibility. I mean, the majority of people just don't have that in them. And the wide sweeping changes that need to be made to save the civilization, I mean, people aren't just, it, even the people who are willing to change aren't willing to make those kind of wide sweeping, you know, the kind of changes in terms of their lifestyle, in terms of their attitude, in terms of their thoughts, in terms of their, you know, I mean, we get down to a, you know, changing the way you, you think about your life and, you know, what you think life is about and changing the way that you, you know, just think about everything. Most people, like, that's really difficult to do. And most people don't even, you know, have an inkling of, of why to do that. And, you know, even if they were shown the, the reason for you needing to change your thoughts, they just couldn't do it. And so there has to be a, a systemic collapse. It has to shock people and shake people up. And there needs to be a lot of people who are just incapable of any sort of change that have to be removed from the equation because they're, you know, they're, they're always going to be a, a block to humanity evolving right people in power people you know whatever it is so if you believe in god and you believe there's a plan there has to be contingencies and the contingencies have to 
eradicate this system that's taking everybody in the wrong direction. The system is making human beings worse. And if you don't think there's a plan, you think it's just chaos, then, you know, inevitably, I mean, the chaos wins. Then there isn't a, the system isn't even, you know, an organized system can't withstand the nature of chaos, right? Like if there's no plan or no order and you see how everyone's breaking down, then chaos is going to ensue. And so either way, whether you believe in God or not, there's there's no way to to logically, I mean, unless you're just in terms of wishful thinking, way to save this system. And that's why there's so many movies about this and th it's being talked about so much. Because, and just historically, empires have all collapsed. And this one is now a global empire and it's, you know, it's on the verge of collapsing. And whatever that means and how that'll play out, you know, again, that's, you know, that's just for whatever, you know, that's, that's to be determined or to be experienced. But, you know, it's going to end soon because it's just up for everybody. Anyways, let's get into the other stuff here. I have a voice or I did yesterday. I'm going to put in here about a sort of a health scare I had. I got dizzy. Today's uh, Tuesday, April 30th. Uh, but, um, which is Babaji's birthday. Um, anyways, um, I got to do something about that. <laughs> I just realized. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, the, um, the second master of the Saj Mark system. But anyways, I had a little bit of a health scare. Fine today. Uh, it was fine yesterday. It was the day before. Not a health scare, just, you know, just something that kind of repetitive, not some big deal. But I want to get into the Christy Gnome dog thing and then some of the other stuff today. Um, but anyways, i got to go deal with this Babaji thing. Okay, today's Monday, April 29th, and, um, you know, I've... Um, and I'll talk about this, I guess, on my other channel as well, or maybe I'll do this part um, on both. I guess I'll put this up on my regular video and then also my Journey series. But, you know, I um, ever since I had COVID, and I guess I had some issues before that, um, every once in a while my body just glitches out. And I've had people say things to me about what I should take or not or what it is. And I've tried all these things. Um, people have said I think I, I'm low in potassium, I think is one of the things. And, um, of course, there's these other various supplements I'm taking, like lots of them. And, you know, I really was doing well um, this past so many months. And I started doing this exercise, um, you know, this thing I got from uh, Jesus Marcola. <laughs> Jesus Marcola, this guy Marcola, who's a, you know, one of the leading natural uh, sort of medicine guys out there, but he's now gone a little bit crazy and says that he's Jesus, or the incarnation of Jesus or something. Uh, he had a, you know, meltdown. I haven't looked back into that, but anyways. Um, but I was doing this exercise. I've been working on cre uh, doing things that... Um, boost my nitric oxide which has been a great thing there's a breathing exercise that I've learned and my energy level really went up I lost weight and um, and I was doing this exercise and I can only do it's basically four rapid movements where you're doing squats and then doing uh, three different arm movements and you know I found it to be a, a really good exercise where you know other than the fact that my, I hurt my shoulder not doing the exercise I just slept wrong <laughs> and I woke up my shoulder was hurt and it's been hurt for a while. I still was able to do the exercise. And, you know, the squatting thing helped me. I lowered back. So I was very happy with it. And I only could do two rounds. You were supposed to do four. But then I got up to four. And then I started doing it better. You know, I, I did it at four. But just, you know, just trying to get through it. And now I, I was learning to do it better. And I was feeling really strong. And, um, you know, I've been in better shape. And my energy levels picked up. And then over the last, I don't know how many days, three, four days, every time I've done the exercise, I've gotten dizzy. And, you know, I don't think it's a heart thing. I haven't had any chest pains or any heart issues. Um, but, you know, my cardio was getting better, and, it, you know, the whole thing seemed to be working, and I just started getting dizzy. But, you know, I'd just slow down, and I would finish the exercise. 
and I'd get through it, but you know, I wasn't I wasn't psyched about it like I had been. Um, and then last night I did the exercise, and I was okay. You know, I got a little bit dizzy, but I was fine. And then I got uh, maybe about half an hour later, I just got really dizzy, and then I ended up going to bed and um, just um, felt weird, like it's just you know whatever it was. And I um, ended up. I was really tired, but I ended up you know doing my cleaning and then meditating. And that made it better a little bit, you know, but then I fell asleep. And, you know, when you fall asleep, you think it's just going to get better and you're going to reset. Your body's just going to reset. But I woke up, I felt worse. I felt just like disoriented and uh, just um, like sort of brain fog. You know, this used to happen when I had COVID. Like I would lay down. I'd be fine until I laid down. And then I would get this sort of, you know, um, dizzy feeling. And then it just, you know, I'd have a bad night. And, you know, if I knew what was causing it and I knew what, you know, I mean, whatever it was, it would be different. Like, you know, I mean, I thought about how when I drank alcohol and used drugs, I would be much more impaired than I was. Like, it's just a small, subtle thing compared to when I was younger. But I knew it was causing that, right? If I felt weird because, you know, I put in some sort of, you know, um, mind-altering substance, conscious-altering substance in my body would be one thing. But I don't think there was anything I could trace back to eating anything or, you know, it was just, I mean, basically doing this exercise. And, you know, it's been a bummer for me because I've I've consistently got stronger and in better shape since, you know, the COVID debacle. And, you know, I wasn't in great shape before that. But then, you know, things like this happen, this glitch-out thing. And so I finally ended up meditating again and I, I did a sitting from the gratefulness meditation channel and I um, felt better after that but um, you know I still feel a little bit weird um, like I just stopped myself today and so you know I don't know what to say I, I slept a lot like I had trouble sleeping at the beginning but I slept late and I don't know like I feel a little bit uh, disoriented or something like that and so yeah that's just what's going on with me <laughs> And my wife said, "Well, you know, you're gonna, you know, look up, it, look, look into this." And I'm like, "I, I just, I can't even, I, I don't even know what to call the symptoms. Like, I get sort of lightheaded and I feel faint when I'm doing the exercise, um, and I don't know if like it's, I, I mean, I don't feel like it's a, a cardiovascular or a heart issue. I used to think it was that. My gut felt a little bit weird um, last night. I've been eating like." Um, kimchi and sauerkraut before I go to bed and that's been really helping my gut I had some migraines you know whatever um but you know I have this thing where I just sort of glitch out it's happened to me first at the Grand Canyon you know people are saying that I was dehydrated and you know the people are saying low, low potassium and some other things that were out there I can't remember all of them you know and I've tried to boost all those things um and I don't know what it is um you know I cut back I was taking taurine and vitamin E and I cut back on some of that because I've just taken too many supplements and then I'm like well maybe some of the supplements like I have too much of them in my system and maybe that's the issue and that's the problem when you don't have you know professionals you can trust like you can you know gauge what you're doing I mean the supplement things I mean I can go and get they have this kind of test that, he, that my chiropractor had this machine that would test whether something you know it's, it's similar to doing muscle testing um, so maybe I can look into that as I move forward here. But, you know, maybe it's just cleaning. Like, that's what I was thinking about because I was having... I had actually a good meditation last night, like a really good one, once I sort of settled down and, um, you know, I pushed through the the dizziness a little bit. And I was like, well, no, this actually feels like maybe it's cleaning. I don't know. Like, it's part of the spiritual thing I have just have to go through. You know, as you get older, things just don't work right. Your body just doesn't work right. It wasn't like I... You know, I was in necessarily crisis, but I was just feeling strong for doing things outside in the summer and, you know, getting things done. And now I'm like, you know, I got to, I, you know, it happened when we were doing the fencing. It seems whenever I tip my head forward, I get, you know, I was getting dizzy. And it just wasn't being dizzy. I just felt like bad. Like it was like my body shut down. Um, you know, when we were doing the fencing, we had to nail the fence to the to the wooden post and you know you have to put nails at the bottom of the post and when I bent over I would feel bad um, and part of it would be, be dizziness I don't know 
So again, it's not really helpful when people just throw out random things because, like, I don't know if people, you know, if someone had something the exact same symptoms. Um, like, and I don't want to call it dizziness. I just felt, like, weird. You know, like, um, I don't know. Well, anyway, let's just move on with other stuff here. You know, I just don't trust the allopathic medicine, and I don't have an alternative practitioner that would be helpful, um, you know. So that's the, I got to figure out things myself, and I'm not really, you know, necessarily a healer or whatever it is. You know, I don't have these, you know, I can do research and figure things out and, like, find out about supplements and whatever it might be. And maybe, you know, it's, it's just, it's difficult given the, the current state of our, you know, medical model. But anyways, let's move on to other stuff here. Okay, so I want to get to the Christy Gnome thing and uh, MSNBC. Morning Joe has a whole, it's kind of funny. Um, she, you know, killed one of her dogs. <laughs> That's not funny. She killed her dog, but obviously. I, I'm a dog lover, right? <laughs> um, you know, the um, I just realized it was Babaji's birthday, so those of you who do gratefulness meditation, I have um, a video up there about the the sittings and the, the group meditations. I just completed one. It's a good one. It kind of explains my health crisis because there was oftentimes a, I go through a cleaning or everyone goes through a cleaning before the gathering. Um, so all that kind of has resolved itself. You know, it's amazing I just kind of spaced on the whole thing. Uh, but I'm not in touch with the heartfulness debacle anymore and I don't interact with people who do gratefulness, you know, so um, other than, you know, on the internet, very, you know, through comments and things like this, occasional message. And so, you know, I'm not... Um, I'm sort of not consciously aware of the whole the gathering thing. You know, every April, July, uh, and um, February, there's these gatherings. But anyways, those of you guys who are interested, go to the Gratefulness Meditation channel. But let's get into the other stuff here. Okay, so the news broke yesterday. Again, today's Tuesday, April 30th. Yesterday was the 29th, Monday. That Christy Nome wrote a book in which she talked about putting down one of her hunting dogs that was misbehaving. And, you know, the mainstream media, the left mainstream media, jumped all over this. You know, I mean, I'm not certainly endorsing her doing this. Like, I, I'll have my own opinion about it, right, like everything else. Um, you know, I'm a big dog person. Like, there's, um, I'll show you a picture of me as a little kid my sister my hippie sister brought home she had a dog called libby that was its full na his full name was liberation he was like a hippie dog that had been abused and he was very you know he didn't have a lot of um i don't know if i have a picture of uh he, you know, he was some kind of a i don't know kind of a mutt that maybe was sort of a a benji looking dog with more hair he was like a medium-sized dog and he, he was a nice dog but didn't like wouldn't play wouldn't fetch balls when you know it's just maybe kind of an older dog who came to live with us but when I was really young my sister brought home a puppy without my parents the knowledge or permission which I named Fluffy and um, there's a caption on the photo that's there that um, Fluffy was a, a female dog and I don't know whether I knew that at the time, but I said, my parents quoted me as saying, I think she, I think she, she loves me, you know, because I couldn't speak properly. And so there was no chance of my parents getting rid of the dog, even though they didn't want to have the dog. Um, but, um, you know, I really loved that dog. And then, you know, they were supposedly trying to train it, and they made up the lie later on. I figured out it was a lie. <laughs> the dog was deaf and was untrainable and so they got rid of it gave it away you know because <laughs> my sister brought home a dog that I didn't um didn't she didn't have permission to, you know my parents didn't want the dog we had a cat for a while we had another puppy for some reason and gave that away when I was a little bit you know older I don't remember the specifics behind that but you know I, we would get a, a working dog named Lucy we went to this um I had a like a you know a thing I was doing this is a picture of Lucy here Lucy was just a you know like a an angel of a dog and Lucy was a dog that they were going to put down you know they had this um 
it was back when I was doing a counseling. You know, the first part of Pockets of the Future was Shruti Counseling, which I, you know, was my first introduction to the internet. I did a PowerPoint presentation. I wrote a, a book about transforming abuse, and I did seminars, not seminars. I went to these, you know, these um, wellness type of, you know, new age kind of things and was talking about the, you know, it was a counseling program. And I set up booths and things, and, you know, it, it didn't take because, you know, people kind of um, are, I don't want to say I revolted, you know, I don't know, uh, revolted by me. You know, they feel uneasy. You know, people, I'm not approachable, <laughs> which I've talked about in the past. But at one of these, um, you know, my family went to one of these sort of wellness, like, uh, you know, it was like a bunch of booths, and they brought dogs there, rescue dogs. And we came upon this dog, Lucy, our border, border collie. She was named Blair at the time, and, you know, it wasn't a good name for her. You know, Lucy means light, and, you know, I later included in my book, My Friend Within. Um, but Lucy was a wonderful dog. You know, half border collie, half something else. Lucy was big for a border collie, a little bit skinny and, you know, t and longer. But she was just a wonderful dog. And, um, you know, at, at that time, I just... You know, we were doing uh, kids stuff like um, I was doing activities for kids at you know, our, our spiritual gathering. And dogs, you know, is God spelled backwards. And I realized that, you know, the way Lucy was in terms of a working dog and a border collie, she always looked at me like, you know, in an obedient way, you know, like I was, you know, God or whatever to her. And like being a, like a disciple you know, she had this put me in coach type attitude, these working dogs, border collies are amazing dogs. And they just naturally heard and, you know, and she was always looking at me for instructions. And, and I realized like, if I was as good as a disciple, if I was as good as a, you know, spiritual aspirant as she was as a dog, you know, with me, right. If I was in my relationship with God, I was like her, I'd be like way better, you know, like, <laughs> Like, she was just so devotional and so, you know, I mean, I can't even, you know, talk about it and describe it. Uh, but I felt like, you know, I, she was a good example for me of, you know, devotion and being, you know, a, a good spiritual aspirant, you know, on a, on a dog level. Just the way she was naturally and the, you know, training that was in that breed of dogs. But I've always been someone who, you know, loves dogs and you know, dogs become part of the family. I mean, it's just the way that dogs relate to people you know I like cats but I mean dogs are so totally different you know are um, they're happier and they're just you know the papillons we have they just the way they walk and the way they do everything they exude happiness and enjoy and enthusiasm but they're also they can be really chill and you know they're not they're not little yappers or anything like that you know but we had this dog Farley who was really cute we love Farley Farley's an amazing dog and you know, Farley got old and she was, or she was losing all of her teeth. You know, she was like 15 years old. The Papillons live kind of a long time. You know, and she just peed all over the place and, you know, she couldn't really see. She was blind. Sometimes we'd like be walking, you know, if we were walking in a place like a beach or we were walking somewhere where there's other people, like at a park or something, she sometimes got confused. She, Papillons naturally heal. And they'll walk really, you know, silently behind you. And you look for them, you turn around, and they're there walking behind you. And sometimes you don't see them, you know, and you, and you go to call them. And she would just walk behind us, even at an older age. But sometimes she'd get confused and start following other people. <laughs> and, you know, she was, um, I mean, I don't know if she was in much physical pain, but she was getting old. And the thought of putting her down, I mean, you know, it's a hard thing to do. Um, and you know, it happened naturally. She wandered off. We were going for a walk and she wandered off and she went into the road, got hit by a car. And so, um, you know, it was sad and my wife was really kind of devastated by it, but it was good timing because we got the other two dogs because of it. And it was just, you know, she was, it was, she was at just that time where she was, you know, um, she was beginning to suffer. And so, you know, I don't know about putting down dogs, but sometimes if you have a dog that's obviously has rabies or you know watch that movie old Lee Eller when I was a kid and, you know it really made me sad or whatever but there's reasons to put down dogs like it isn't something you know 
I mean, there's 70 million dogs in the country and there's, you know, all these dogs that are um, unwanted dogs, dogs that are on the loose. Packs of wild dogs are very dangerous, right? And so, you know, it isn't like that's something that's out of the, the question. Like, I don't know Christy Nome's specific story. I didn't read the, the section of her book, and they're going to present it here on MSNBC. And so, you know, I have mixed feelings about it is what I'm saying, right? Like, I don't like Christy Nome. I think she's, you know, I don't like these Republicans any more than the Democrats. But the Democrats are so much worse because they have more power right now. And so it's hard for me to say how I feel about this, you know, act. But the way that they present it here on Morning Joe is just despicable, right? It's self-serving, like using this as a way to, you know, another way to demonize Trump and, you know, the whole thing. So let's get into it here. South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem is defending her decision wow. to kill her 14-month-old female dog, Cricket. It's a puppy, actually. Kill so, the puppy, yeah. Noem, who's considered a contender to become Donald Trump's vice presidential running mate, received back... Like, it almost like Mika cried there. <laughs> ...clash from both sides of the aisle after a passage in her upcoming memoir revealed a startling anecdote where she admitted to murdering her dog according to an ex okay so murdering is for people who are pro-abortion who are pro-choice you don't want to bring the word murder up where you know in this connotation for people who eat meat they're meat eaters right um you don't want to bring up the word murder like the hypocrisy here like i you know again i don't like this person christy Nome. you know i mean they, to me these people are all posers and different whatever and Republicans are sucky. They just are. And she's trying to appeal to a, you know, she wrote this book as a way to appeal to people of a certain, you know, mindset, right? Um, but anyways, let's get back to it here. Excerpt from The Guardian. Gnome took Cricket, that's the little girl puppy. puppy's name, the puppy. on a pheasant hunt with yeah. older dogs. Okay, but so, you know, the, the thing is that it isn't a puppy, right? A dog that old isn't considered a puppy. You know, the official story is that dogs become adults between one and two. And she was 18 months old. Or 14 months, a year and two months. But she was full grown. Dogs are full grown when they're a year old, right? I mean, they might get bigger. You know, they're, I mean, it's, they're basically, you know, adolescents that you would say. Maybe it was like an adolescent dog or something or whatever it was. But to say that it's a puppy, you know, a puppy is something different, right? Like, this is, you know, they're, I mean, they're using this dog for political gain. Like, they're pretending they're caring and, like, such a, she's such a horrible person. But if this was Hunter Biden that did it, they'd be talking about it completely different, right? They wouldn't be talking about it, right? Like, they wouldn't even cover this thing if it was one of the Biden family or something like that or Joe Biden. You know, Joe Biden had a dog that was biting Secret Service and should have been put down. Like Joe Biden, there's a dog story that they should cover with Joe Biden having a dog that bit multiple Secret Service agents and was poorly trained. You know, they're a senile guy. Um, like, there's always a Biden story when they cover a Trump story. Like, there's always a Trump story when they cover a Biden story. Right? There's always, because these are the same guys. They have parallel lives. It's that the young pup ruined the hunt after chasing the birds and going out of her oh mind Oh my God, with what's excitement. she going to do? She had a bad morning. So the dog was bounding around with excitement yeah. and so happy. So she said too happy. Gnome describes calling Cricket, Cricket, then using an electronic collar to attempt to bring her under control. One of those shock collars, you know? Mm. Nothing worked to stop Cricket from running around with joy. Then on the way home, after the hunt, as Gnome stopped to talk to a local family, Cricket escaped Gnome's truck and attacked the family's chickens, grabbing one chicken at a time, crunching it to death with one bite, By the way, and the, then dropping the, it to the, attack this another. Happens. The question is, like, how can a That's governor- That's a terrible moment. How I've can a governor there. not keep- I've been there. A dog under control? Well, it happens. Put it on a leash. Well, how can a president not keep a dog under control? How can a president keep a dog from biting people? Government employees are there to protect them, right? I mean, this happened. Like, Biden has a dog. Here it is. Commander, 
jumped at me and bit me on the left arm. I sustained two puncture marks and the skin was broken with blood present. This is from CNN. What kind of a dick who's president names his dog commander, right? <laughs> what kind of dick you got to be, you know, commander in chief to name your dog commander? Biden's dog secrets, bit secret service agents at least 24 times. 24 times. So you're only allowed to do it once. And there's a dog that should be put down, right? And it's a German Shepherd. German Shepherds are great dogs. And, you know, usually it's an owner-related issue. But, um, you know, it's something where there are times you have to put a dog down. There's dogs with hips dis displeasure, you know, and I'll get into that in a bit, right? There's reasons why dogs act out. Some of them in abuse, some of them in wrecks, some of them whatever. They can be wild, whatever it might be. And on the way home after the hunt, as Gnome stopped to talk to a local family, Cricket escaped Gnome's truck and attacked the family's chickens, grabbing one chicken at a time, crunching it to death with one bite, By the way, and the, then dropping the, it to the, attack this another. This happens. The question is, like, how can a That's governor... a terrible moment. How I've can a governor there. not keep... I've been there. ...a dog under control? Well, it happens. Put it on a leash... Or, or whatever she's blaming the dog this is the part i don't understand out of the truck i hated that dog gnome writes adding that cricket had proved cricket. herself cricket untrainable cricket so this isn't great this part is the part i you know she wrote this in a book i hated that dog cricket. it's cricket. dangerous it's to the, anyone she came in contact with cricket not her and less worth it, worthless oh as a hunting God. dog cricket at that moment, Gnome said... See, they paraphrased that. As I realized I had to put all right, it down. All right, all right, all right. It I, was I, not a pleasant job, Jeez. she writes, she but it took, had to be done. She took the puppy to a gravel pit. Again, the puppy. Now, these are people who are pro-abortion, right? And they're making it sound that a puppy killing something that's younger is worse than killing something that's older, right? And so if you kill a puppy, it's worse than killing an adult dog. That's what they're saying. Of course it is. Puppies are so cute and lovable. You know, I mean, it's hard to even imagine killing a puppy. So they're making it, you know, sound like it's worse than it is by saying the word puppy. And yet they're totally on board with murdering a fetus, you know, <laughs> right? And so, I mean, this is where the hypocrisy is off the charts. And, and After Noam's story caused controversy, the governor doubled down and tried to paint the story as one of the necessary dark sides of farm life. No. Writing on X, the fact is South Dakota law states that dogs who attack and kill livestock can be put down. Given that Cricket had shown aggressive behavior toward people by biting them, I decided, <laughs> the dog tried to bite her. I decided what I did, yeah, I followed the law and, a, her in and a was responsible pit. All right. Being responsible right, parent dog I, owner We've, we've done enough of this. I, I, so Hold on. She... So um, they're getting into it a little bit here. Then oh, she then God. revealed that she killed the family goat. Okay, so the idea that they, the dog was aggressive and bites people is a real thing you have to deal with, and I'll get into this in a moment, right? Because it was gross, and it... Let's go back here a little bit. She killed the family goat because it was gross. <laughs> <laughs> and it knocked down her kid. Goats do that. Let, let, Goats let, can be a little gross. Let, 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 but yeah. she killed it in the gravel pit. No way, oh, the gravel pit? Along with the puppy. The puppy, right? Again, with the puppy. Let's bring in right now former White House Director of Communications and President Obama, Jen Palmieri. She's co host of MSNBC podcast, How to Win 2024 and Survive Your Goat and MSNBC contributor and author of the book, How the Right Lost Its Mind and Started Killing Puppies in Gravel Pits. Kind of a strange title for a book, but I guess he saw this coming. Charlie Sykes. Charlie, okay, we, we could talk about the tragedy of cricket and this- The tragedy. Poor guy. You know, like Joe Biden droned um, eight kids. I just covered this. And- civilians recently in Afghanistan. So did Obama. You know, and then the wars that they voted for. I mean, how many animals were killed and how many, you know, puppies were... I mean, there's all these tragedies that go along with war in terms of animal life, right? And But Biden droning kids, and they didn't even cover that. And they didn't even mention it, right? And like, at least, you know, 
in any way like this condemning the guy. And he did it as political posturing, the same way that Christy Noem is posturing here. Fest you know, or whatever it is, it's but more what's going through her mind well, that makes her think she should murder a puppy in cold blood immediately after getting angry. No, well, like they're disputing this thing. Look, look at her. Look how crazy she is. <laughs> you can do that, but it's the confessional aspect, Charlie. The confessional aspect was done as a political pose. I'm tough. Right. I'm me. I'm murder. Puppies. I'm an sob. I'll even kill a little puppy if... Yeah, that's not, you know... It gets in my way. I mean, I think that's the sickest part of this, that Donald Trump's Republican Party and, and, and the grotesque, the grotesqueness of the conservatives... These are all meat eaters, right? I would assume none of these people are vegetarian. And so they're having animals and the, the cruelty that goes into factory farms. I don't know whether they eat... You probably eat grass-fed meat and, you know, whatever they eat that normal people don't can't afford and things like this. The average people can't. But, you know, they're outsourcing this kind of things. You know, that um, I bet this guy posed as a hunter. You know, he was once a Republican senator or whatever it was. And so I'm sure he posed with guns and all these things. Um, you know, uh, either way, he's a meat eater. These people are all outsourcing their, you know, animal animal cruelty to these factory farms or whatever. Conservative movements. Uh, Do we have a picture of violent, cricket? Let me finish, please. Viol let me finish, please. She, look at me because she's going to take you to the gravel pit, Joe. Violent <laughs> wing. This is where they go. This is virtue signaling for Republicans. This is virtue signaling. I shot in cold blood a puppy and a gravel pit. I think that is the most extraordinary part about all of this, that she thought that this would be a plus for her. Look, this book is a campaign book. Uh, it is a resume to be Donald Trump's vice president. And she thought it was a good idea. Let's include this story. Let's tell this story about myself, how I took this puppy and shot him in the gravel pit. So again, with the puppy. Now, that's true. Like she wrote this book as a way to promote herself and appeal to certain demographics about, you know, people who live on farms, people who live in rural areas, people know about these things. And let me switch over to my voice over here. So I want to talk about this a little bit. So if you have a farm, you have livestock, obviously if you have, you know, meat, animals, or whatever it might be, you inevitably are going to have to put animals down. And I'll get into that in a moment. But, you know, the homestead I have here, we have here, you know, we have... Um, some of our acres are are there for, you know, just pasture acres that we're not using right now. And we don't hay it. And it's created a sanctuary for animals and birds. We have right now uh, red-winged blackbirds nesting. Um, we have, uh, you know, in the fields, we have um, meadowlarks, which are cool uh, as well. You know, both beautiful birds. They're nesting there. We have some ponds that have, you know, give life to frogs and turtles and things like this. And, of course, we have some honeybees and we have all these, you know, flowers and things we plant and things that grow naturally. We have like a crop of um, goldenrod that comes up at the end of the summer and all these, you know, animals that do these uh, birds and um, these, uh, you know, bees and all these different forms of natural pollinators come to our place. And we provide, you know, like a haven for them, right? And we, you know, my wife and I love walking and seeing different animals. We have all kinds of cool spiders and um, like praying mantises. And like there's an ecosystem here, right? And we have a couple of, uh, we have three areas where there's water. We have a, I made a little water garden and we had in that water garden, we had these nymphs for dragonflies, which were cool. I was studying them for a while. Like I spent all this time looking at these things. Tadpoles are always being hatched out. Toads, we have all these baby toads that... We see at a certain time in the summer, you know, like thousands of them. And only, you know, so many make, them, make it, and there's predator animals that come in and eat them. And, and so we have, like, just, a, you know, abundance of wildlife here. And then we have, you know, we've had cows, which, you know, they ended up being meat cows. We no longer have them. They were processed. And, you know, we have um, birds. We have, uh, you know, we have chickens. And you have to protect your birds from predators. 
and sometimes you need to put them down and you know even the birds themselves they don't lay eggs anymore and they get old and they're not you know functioning if you're being, being a good farmer which we're not doing that right now you have to get rid of your you have to call your your flock as they stop laying and you know because it's no longer cost effective right you're spending like based in chicken feed and everything else you're spending um you know like twenty dollars for for to have eggs you know like see what i'm saying it's you can buy eggs cheaper at the store and to be a good farmer and to be someone you would know, farming in an efficient way yeah that's something you had to do it's something that i had to do in the past it's very unpleasant right like i, I you know there's people who get joy out of killing things but i'm not one of them and certainly a family pet is a whole nother thing right but if you have dogs that bite and kill livestock you know anything on the farm that's aggressive you have to put down i mean it's just what you're supposed to do and sometimes you get animals that show up that have rabies you know there was a story i was reading or you know maybe it was a video i was watching this is years and years ago where someone was describing how they were with their grandfather and they were driving in his you know truck and there was a fox out in the middle of the day and it was just staring at him right which is unusual behavior i mean how many times have you seen foxes in your life right like i've seen a fox like a like three times you know like I think I've seen foxes in the wild like three times in my life. Two, two I can remember. And so at least two. And they were, one of them was walking down the road and that one probably had rabies, right? And so the guy says, the, the, the kid, the person telling the story says his grandfather pulled out his rifle and, and shot the, the fox. And he said that thing had rabies because it's, you know, the way it was behaving. And if you see something like that, you have to put the animal down for your own animals and then you know whatever else people and and whatever is right it's a danger to other animals right something has rabies and things like this um but you know it's something that a farm you have to deal with and there's so many people that eat meat that don't you know could never kill an animal which i mentioned in a video a while back like a long time ago and i said everybody who eats meat should at least at some point have a you know have the experience of killing an animal that they're eating you know, just because you're doing it, you know, you're outsourcing your, you know, the unpleasant part of eating meat, right? And a vegan said that that he hopes somebody shot me. <laughs> a vegan said that, like, showed up on my, on my channel. And so it's just, um, there is this element of that, right? Now here's, um, I'll show you this picture of my, my dog, Angel, that we had for a short period of time. And Angel was a menace. We wanted a Great Pyrenees dog. They're wonderful dogs that you know you raise from a puppy with your with your herd, and they identify with the herd, and they protect the herd. They're like you know, I mean, coyotes run from them. Like they'll chase coyotes like two or three miles. They chase anything with pointy ears. They've been bred to do this, and they're just wonderful dogs. We saw one that was. We got our goats. We bought our goats. Um, our Nigerian dwarf goats. From this woman who had alpacas you know alpacas are very expensive animals they can be up to 20 grand or even more than that and they have a long gestation period it's like 16 14 16 months or something you know humans have nine months right they have 14 months they carry their babies for over a year and they had the goat um because goat milk and alpaca milk is very similar in case one of the babies that was rejected by the mom and wasn't being nursed or something and they had these great Pyrenees dogs in with the goats and the alpacas, and they were just really neat. So we found one that was on Craigslist, but the dog had been always on a chain. And so I put her in our pasture, and she got out and chased our neighbor's horses. My neighbor got pissed at me, you know, they ran around the neighborhood. And I kept on fixing the fence where she was getting out. She was a huge dog, but she found a way to push through, you know, very small holes. I mean, it's crazy. And at one point, um, we you know the dog was um running chasing my neighbor's horses and my neighbor called me and i went and got her and she was covered in horse poop and i clipped her leash to the bed of the truck you know and she um and i'm driving and i look out the rearview mirror and she's out of the truck choking to death so i have to pull over the truck and i have to pick her up and i get you know horse crap all over me <laughs> it was like a nightmare 
And I'm like, this dog's a disaster, right? And she was a sweet dog. Lucy didn't like her, you know, other dog. And I put her on Craigslist, Craigslist and people came and got her. Someone else, you know, she became somebody else's problem. But she was a dog that was going to have to remain on a leash, which is not how that kind of dog is bred, right? You know, somebody got the dog and she was on a little bit of a run, like the leash had a, you know, was one of those leashes that was on a longer cable. But, you know, dogs like that are supposed to be roaming around the pasture and, you know, the person had a number of these great Pyrenees and they just weren't, you know, it wasn't handling them very well. But there was a person that bought one of our cows and there was a family and they had, um, you know, a big farm and they, a lot of, you know, different animals. to get all kinds of animals. Like it was like a, almost like a zoo there. And they got some great Pyrenees dogs and one of their dogs who was, you know, a puppy got out and killed the neighbor's um, birds and, you know, it had run like a mile and a half away from the house and the they ordered that the dog be put down. And this woman was really, she, I think that she had just had a miscarriage so she was already like grieving and she was crying in front of the judge. She told us a story that she was crying in front of the judge begging that they would give the dog away to somebody else. But the judge said, no, we got to put her down. You know, this is a, an area in Virginia that has a lot of farms and things. And it just had killed some birds. It didn't bit, bite anybody or anything like that, right? And so there's, you know, this is a real thing. Like, people live in farming areas, and they have, you know, some dog comes into your neighborhood, uh, kind of comes into your farm and kills your livestock. It's a, you know, you, you want that dog put down, right? We were walking our, our dogs on the beach, or we were uh, with our dogs on the beach, and I throw the dogs, um, I throw... Uh, Tulsi a golf ball and Buddy a super ball and I was throwing Tulsi the ball sometimes Buddy doesn't, isn't into it and she was going to get it and a dog that was on the beach that was chained and they had staked the dog to the beach a big giant dog broke free of its stake and started running towards Tulsi and Tulsi was you know usually our dogs are so fast and nimble that they can you know they just their other dogs have chased them playfully and they just outrun them uh, but the, this dog had to kind of pinned between the ocean and Tulsi had nowhere to go. And the dog was just about to clamp down. I mean, the dog's mouth was wide open. It was inches away from Tulsi. And I yelled no, like really loud, like as loud as I could. And the dog stopped and ran away. And the, and the people chased it, right? But if that dog had killed Tulsi, I would want that dog, you know, put down. And really it's the people that are, you know, they shouldn't bring a dog like that to the beach, right? Like, you don't bring a dog that's aggressive like that and you know, out of control. And, you know, it comes down to the people as well. And so, you know, it's a whole thing, right? Like, it's not as simple as these two clowns were making it out to be. Okay, so I had to make lunch, and I went out and did a bunch of work outside. Beautiful day today. It's, uh, you know, the first day of a gathering and a good sitting. Really nice day today. Feel better physically. I was working hard, and, you know, that whole thing seemed to pass me by or whatever which is good you know so I just want to wrap this up one of my old roommates got an old Rottweiler the guy wanted to get into security he kind of lost it right he went into you know whatever but he got this Rottweiler and um, it had been locked up in a basement it was just a messed up dog and it was just it would walk around the apartment it was totally dangerous and smelled bad and you know, it was just, um, you know, kind of a scary dog. It probably weighed, you know, it was big, really big Rottweiler. And it just hadn't been trained and loved and had no sense of any kind of thing. He dated some girl who was um, a dog groomer and a dog trainer, and she tried to work with it and, and it, you know, tried to bite her, and she f figured out a hip dysplasia and had to be put down. And so there are things like that that happen. Any dog that gets aggressive, you know, I've seen this before. Then you have animals that predatory animals that come after your chickens and things like this and your livestock and whether you like those type of animals or not you know the livestock is there in a sense under your protection just like your farm is and so you have to deal with things like this but going back to this nature reserve if you go to any pasture raised animals you see people who have pastures and they're keeping horses and you know there's vegans who don't want you to to ride a horse there's this woman I talked to years and years ago you know used to watch this youtube channel she had a vegan she had a farm for 
um, animals, like rescued animals, and she was a vegan, and she had a lot of vegan support, but she had rescued horses that she would ride, and all the vegans would turn on her. You know, it's just like this whole thing. But um, what I want to say about it is when you have pastures, there's so much life in the pastures. Like all these people who claim to be animal lovers, but if these people who, you know, who are vegetarian or vegan, the way that they do farming is they destroy all the natural habitats for these various animals. And, you know, look at animals coming in, you know, that are eating the vegetables, but they have to deal with those animals, right? Like how many um, animals have to die for an acre of vegetables, right? They always talk about how cows are, you know, um, creating so much CO2, but there's a lot more oxygen coming from the grass and the, the pastures than it is some, um, you know, tilled farm soil. And so there's death of animals and death of plants and all these things, right? Like when you live as an organic life form, unless you somehow evolve out of eating, you can somehow you know, sustain yourself without eating. But even then you're breathing in microbes and things from the air that die in your body or whatever, right? And so, you know, life takes life. And, you know, sometimes population reduction is necessary. I mean, I don't mean just in terms of the human population, but any species. And so there's, a, you know, death is a part of life. Predators are necessary and animals like vultures and possums who clean up the, the carcasses. I mean, all these things are necessary. And, the, you know, the nutrition of the, the dead carcass goes into the soil and all these things. And there's, you know, like this cycle of life type of thing. And so people who are living in suburbs and scared of animals, scared of insects, right? You know, vegan because they don't want to hurt any animals, but they still... I could tell you all the different ways if you dissected that person's life that animals are harmed by their lifestyle without them knowing it, right? They're supporting animal torture in one way or another, even though they're not eating meat, they're doing other things that creates, you know, like I said, when you plow a field, when you cut a field down with, you know, like a, when I go bush hog our field and I keep it on high, I'll see all these animals scurrying. I see rats and mice every time, sometimes other animals. There's, you know, rabbits sometimes nesting there. You could expose a baby, you know, some baby rabbits or whatever. And then when you go till the soil, there's all this stuff that runs out of the soil. Frogs and, you know, some things don't make it, right? And so, you know, and that habitat is now gone. You know, we got about four acres or, and so in pasture out there. And then, you know, in our yard, we have rabbits. We have all kinds of different mice and rodents, raccoons come through there. And then all the various, you know, reptile type things, probably five, six, seven different species, more than that, probably about 15 or 20 species of frogs and toads. And, you know, just these are things I've just seen, things that, that we haven't seen. There's so many moles and other things like that. I mean, it's teeming with life. And then you get into all the insects and things like that. Organic farms are at war with insects, just like all these other farms are, right? And, you know, there's a way to do it. Like we have fruit trees and things, and we plant enough that animals can eat some of it. Like we, we saw this guy, a guy had a, you know, we, we've taken these, we've watched these educational video series, and this guy's got a sort of permaculture food forest type thing. And he says, you know, he do devotes about five or 10% to his crop that animals can come eat, which is, you know, kind of a good way to do it. You're, you're actually attracting these animals that you want to interact with deer and these other things. Of course, you don't want them eating the bark of the trees, but you can find ways around all that stuff, right? But if you're eating corporate sustained food, big farm, big, you know, big factory farm type food, even if it's organic, they're destroying a lot of habitat. They're killing a lot of animals. They're killing a lot of insects. And, you know, you're supporting that, right? <laughs> you know, it's just like everybody wants to de demonize the other side. But our civilization has done a lot of damage to nature. And in some cases, supported nature. There are species that are flourishing. You know, deer really like, you know, suburbs. I see deer in the various places outside the cities because they um, they like the underbrush. They don't do as well in forests. They like the, the low-level level sort of underbrush that grows you know, around yards and things like this. But anyways, you know, people have decimated the the ecosystem wherever people live, especially in the cities. And you're a city living person, and then you're like, oh, I'm an animal lover. Well, you're not really, right? 
I mean, you're supporting the destruction of animal habitat. Anyways, I want to wrap this one up. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paramano, definitely important for the apocalypse. In the ascension, everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.